since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. But some joy on my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins which were many are all washed away. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy on my soul like the sea bells roll Since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in that city I know Since Jesus came into my heart And I'm happy, so happy as long as I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Joy on my soul like the sea bells roll Since Jesus came into my heart All right, you guys are singing good this morning. We're going to go to another oldie. Amen. An oldie said amen. All right, there you go. <laughs> another oldie said amen. All right, standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, crowned to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword. Standing on the promises of God. promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing I'm standing on the promises of God Amen! Good singing, everybody. How you guys doing? doing well. Woohoo! All right, ten oh five. Welcome to church. Welcome. It's good to see these these uh, lovely faces, uh, handsome faces, right? Um, so, for those that are tuning in, we want to welcome you at Fellowship at Field Store. You guys could be seated real quick. 
Uh, a few announcements. Um, as you guys know, unfortunately, we had to postpone our garage sale uh, because of the storm. However, it is up and running uh, next Saturday at 8 o'clock. We need some volunteers at 7 if you guys can be here. Uh, these proceeds will be going to our youth and missions. So uh, my anticipation is for the youth to be here. This is going to be for y'all. So you guys need to be here. Um, so 7 o'clock, we will start right at 8 o'clock. Uh, so uh, it's going to be, we, we're, we're giving you an extended week, per se, of, of uh, bringing your stuff, okay? So uh, to bring it over here, again, this is going to be a great thing that we look forward to as a church and as a community. Uh, second thing is, is that we have our youth day camp, which starts on Tuesday. This coming Tuesday, uh, it's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, so if you have not signed up your youth to do so, uh, please approach uh, Pastor Joseph, and we'll give you more information about that. It's going to be an extravagant, extravagant week, uh, uh, starting on Tuesday all the way up to Friday. And Friday, we're going to do, should I go ahead and spill the beans on what we're doing? Okay, so Friday, we're actually going to go and have a beach day and have a beach uh, bonfire uh, in like Bryan, Quintana, Quintana Beach area down south on 288. So it's going to be an exciting day. And also, uh, we're hoping that if uh, for those that accepted Christ and want to be baptized, we're offering that opportunity for you to be baptized right there at the beach. That's so it's going to be an exciting day for us. So uh, we too need some volunteers for that. Uh, so parents, uh, members, uh, visitors, if you want to be involved in that, well, please let us know. I'll talk to Pastor Joseph. Uh, next thing is that, as you know, as we're you know, moving into the digital age of uh, streaming our sermons uh, since COVID-19, we're going to do that. However, we have some kinks that we're still working on. We want to tell you uh, just to be patient with us. Give us some feedback, uh, depending on kind of where you live sometimes and your internet speed. And our internet speed sometimes may cause some, some issues. But let us know. Give us some feedback. We are working through those things, Okay. So uh, it's great to be in God's house today. We have our admin team, uh, just real quick, admin team right after Service City starting at 1 o'clock as well. So feel, feel free to, uh, if you're part of that group, to stay uh, as we're going to talk about some really great things. Uh, would you join with me in prayer? Uh, Father God, uh, we come before you and thank you so much, Father, for bringing us here to worship you, to worship God, God that created the universe, God that created us, Wow. And Lord, you, you've never, never left. You're always with us in every situation, every situation we face. Lord, we can lean on you for strength. We can lean on you for comfort. We can lean on you knowing, God, that when we pray, when we ask, Lord, you, you hear them. And that you answer them in ways that are beyond us in our finite minds. So, Lord God, as we come before you, prepare our hearts to receive your word and for the seeds to be planted within so we can yield fruits. It can bear fruits 50, 100, 1,000, Lord. And let us know, God, that when we approach you, that you give us courage with whatever circumstances and issues and that we've come across. Lord, you're going to give us courage and you're going to walk us through it. Thank you, God. Thank you for our church body that's here, those that are tuning in, and those guests, Lord, we want to say, Father God, we want to bring to our fold, Lord God, so that we can multiply and share and grow and mature in our faith in you. Be with us today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm going to turn it to uh, Carl for our generosity giving. So this morning, I just want to remind you that God hasn't changed. We've got a virus that we're facing, political unrest in our country. But you know what? He's still on the throne. Amen? And He wants us to remain faithful as well. And I want to just commend you guys one more week. I get a little report from uh, Brother Wendell every once in a while. It shows where our giving level is. And you guys have been doing an awesome job. So the ministry can carry on. One thing Joy and I were talking about this morning, she brought it up. And if we're separated from each other by distance, but that doesn't mean that ministry can stop. 
know we've got to reach out and touch other people. So giving includes our finances, of course, but giving also includes our going. Giving includes spending time. Giving includes contacting others who need encouragement. And we've got plenty of those kind of folks in our fellowship and those kind of folks who live around you and in the neighborhood with you. So I just want to encourage you this morning that as God is faithful, and He is, that we remain faithful too. Darkness tries to over my bones. When sorrow comes to steal the joy I am. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. need to change that last line. We are standing in your love. Amen? In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light till from the heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophecy to a virgin gave a word from the throne of salvation 
Jesus for us take you stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. That includes us, y'all. The church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel true love all shall not kneel, shall not gaze. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Forevermore, for endless days, 
Father, we look forward to the day when we can stand in your presence, having been declared guilt-free, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but exclusively and only because Jesus, Lord Jesus, you came, you lived a perfect life, you died a substitutionary death on the cross on our behalf, and you paid the penalty for our sin. And for that reason alone, we can stand in our Father's presence and hear him say, we are declared not guilty. And oh God, we thank you for that. And I just pray that today, God, that that would burn deep into our hearts. And then in times like this, when we're separated from others by distance, that we wouldn't be separated from them, but we could pick up a phone or send an email or a text or, or wave, drive by and wave, whatever we can do, take connections with others. That's what you want us to be doing. You don't want us to change. You don't want to cocoon. You don't want us to be isolated from others. You want us to carry your message. That is the only directive you've ever given us. And help us, God, to be obedient, to do that very thing, mm. to carry the message with us wherever we are. And by whatever means we can transmit that message, help us to do that. And help us to do it effectively. God, we just lift up Pastor Jackson this morning. Pray, Holy Father, you would fill his heart and his mind that the words that come out of his mouth today, Holy Spirit, would be God-directed, God-spoken, God-breathed. Words that, that carry with him the weight of life. God, your life is the only life that matters. Help us to live in, a, in humble obedience to you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys could be seated. Woo. All right. So turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 7. We've been going through the book of Acts uh, for some time now, more like two months. <laughs> so we should be masters of the book of Acts, right? Um, so as you guys know, the book of Acts is the book of transition, right? From law to grace, from Jew to Gentile, from anticipating for Jesus to come to Jesus having come, right? And then now we face certain issues of the churches, right? Uh, two weeks ago, we saw the, the, uh, the, the, the deacon body that came into being because of the neglecting of, of, of serving food for the widows. And what became a conflict came, became an opportunity for the church. And so we have deacons today in churches that we have because of those very instances in Acts chapter 6. So now as we move forward, as we talked about this last week, we talk about a man named Stephen. Stephen coming into picture, and we'll see later on, he becomes the first martyr that we know in the church age. Right. So let me just recap real quick on the life of Stephen. Right. So here in verse uh, chapter Chapter 6, verse 8, And Stephen, full of grace, power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men uh, from what was called the synagogue of the free men, including the uh, Cy Cy Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and people from Sicilia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But verse 10 says, But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So where does this wisdom and this, this spirit that comes from, where does it come from in, in the life of Stephen? And as we see the, the parameters around that, we see the parameters that as Christians, we are gonna, going to face opposition with what we proclaim, what our testimony of who God is in our life. And so he faces this very key issue today. And we talked about this last week about how do we defend our faith? How do we defend our faith in the midst of opposition because the culture is very counter-Christian uh, to this day that we live in? So in this short clip of video, I want you guys to see what the barometer is about Christianity and their belief in God. So let's show that clip real quick. You believe in God? No. You don't believe in God? I am an atheist. It's just I don't even deal with it one way or another. I observe people's beliefs. It's fine. You know, whatever gets you through the night, that's cool with me. Listen, do you believe in God? Uh, yes. Do not, you? 
Yes. You're not sure. Like a higher power. Yeah. yeah. A Same. higher power. A higher power. So, yeah. Do you believe in God? Uh, yes, I do believe in God. What do you believe? I believe in uh, Buddhism. Oh, Buddhism. Yes, sir. Okay, I was 13 and I thought, and I saw Harry Potter and I thought I was a wizard. Really? Just because my mom <laughs> was like all about that. What, now, what do you believe? I believe in spiritualism. I believe in karma quite a bit. I believe whatever you, you send out, negative energy, you get back 10 times. We're all carbon-based beings in the same universe, so. Carbon-based being, that sounds awfully impersonal. I guess so. You, do you believe in God at all? Um, I'm a spiritual person. Yeah? What does that mean? Um, I'm not sure if I believe in a God. Um, I believe in, um, again, I'm a spiritual person. I don't know if I necessarily believe in God. I wish more people asked themselves those kinds of questions. Uh, I do believe in like a higher calling, um, a greater, uh, a greater force out there. Do you believe in God? You bet. Why do you say it like that? Well, uh, I think everybody should. Oh, yeah, well, well, talk to people who don't. Well, that's, that's their choice, but <laughs> yeah. they're wrong, but that's OK. <laughs> do I believe in God? Yeah. Yes. Why? Why? Yeah. It's, it's been a long path. It didn't just uh, happen. I was very adamantly against the idea of God for a long time. Do you believe in God? Well, you know, I don't know that I uh, am a book God person. You know what I mean? In terms yeah. of man-made God. I think there probably is a God, but I don't think another, I don't think you've got all the answers or, no, no. you know, or any other man does. All right, here's the... Here's the question of the day. Do you believe in God? Um, yes, we are. We do. Why? Why? Because you have to believe in something. Yeah. So do you believe in God? Yeah. But I don't know um, Which, how God is. Yeah. Um, it's important to believe in something, but I don't know what it is. But do you believe in God? I want to. I have questions. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? The, an example of the kind of question you might ask God. You know, whether God exists or not. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think there's a creator. Um, I, I am Greek Orthodox. I was born and raised there. Oh. Um, um, and goes to church every I Sunday. I do go to church every Sunday. Um, oh. And I want to believe. I think yeah. I, I believe more in like the power of positive thinking. A personal God is, I think I myself is a God to myself. You're a God to yourself. My world, I am the... At the end, I rule my own world, so I'm a god of myself. I believe in God because, all right, I'm a computer programmer. I know how right. hard it is to design things. Right. I know that making something function is just debugging days, 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 days. And then I look around and I see this universe we live in and how complicated and insanely extreme it is. And I could never do this. No one around could ever do this. And I don't think chance could ever do this. Wow. So. Interesting. Do you believe in Jesus? I do. Why? Um, because I've looked around at a lot of alternatives, and that one wins. Woo! You believe in God? No. Okay. So take take a look around. That video was centered. I don't know if you guys know kind of the background. That's probably in the Chicago area. Um, saw the fountain, all that stuff, right? So. So that was, that was filmed five years ago. Do you think that has changed today? Changed for the good or changed for the worse? This is what we're up against as believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many people that are lost. They're seeking answers. If you know... Well, there's that one gentleman that says, do you believe something? Well, I believe some. I, you, you just have to believe in something. Or I, I go to, I have questions, but I, I go to church, but I don't really believe in God. So, so you have these very kind of a, you know, strange answers on what and who God is. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that Stephen knew who his God was. And he can answer accordingly to what was question about his faith in God. And we're going to talk about that today. So we are living as a time where we're not on the offensive anymore as Christians. 
we're living in a defensive stance, right? And I quoted this last week. Offense wins games. Defense wins championships. That's the difference, right? So our question is, do we firmly believe in Jesus Christ? If we are going to testify on our belief in Christ, do we truly, truly believe and know about Christ enough in our minds and our actions that we can defend it and discuss among people that don't think like us, that might be agnostic, that might be an atheist, that might be spiritual, (laughs) right? But not know God. Are we ready for that? Because the time is here. The time is now. We live in a very post-modern, post-Christian culture. And as I said last week, if you look at the lives in Europe, and we, we are one century behind them on their thinking and their way of life and their view of who God is. We live in a very relevi- uh, uh, relativistic culture. What does that mean? Where, where that means that what, what is good for me may not be good for you, and what was good for you may not be good for me right? And we also live in very pantheistic culture. What is pantheism? Pantheism is all, of, uh, all is God and God is all. And you saw some of that by the interviews he, that we just saw on this short clip. Basically, I'm my own God. Recognize that gentleman, right? He said that. I'm the person that controls my destiny. That's very dangerous. That's the culture we live. So I might, Kurt, my, my challenge for you is we need to really know who Jesus is and that we can have those conversations and we can have those very deep spiritual conversations with Christ, about Christ and our faith. And I mentioned this to you guys, this, is that our failure is not our faith. Our failure is not being able to articulate and defend our faith. Our failure is not allowing and challenging ourselves to open, to investigate the overpowering evidence and the uh, explanatory power that speaks to and provides answers for the deepest needs of our heart. Our defense comes from this word, apologia. In 1 Peter 3, verse 15, it says here, but sanctify Christ as the Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense. This word, apologia, comes from this word, defense, to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So this very word, defense, we need to learn how to defend our faith, not just personally, but from maybe a philosophical standpoint, right? And we talked about this last week. Does God exist, right? Does God exist? How do we prove that? We talked about the cosmological argument, right? Remember? The cause. Someone has to cause something to move, and for that something to move, and so forth and so on. Someone has to cause that thing, and that is God. We talked about the teleological, right? The T-I, right? Intelligence. So if you look at your human eye, you see every spear, every lens, uh, all the muscles, those little small muscles that you can't even see, right, working together indicates that there is an intelligent designer, God, that created you and me. And we talked about the moral argument, right? The moral argument is that in every society there is a good and there's a bad. We strive to do good. Because of that, God exists because he's the moral giver, right? He's the just. He's the judge. He implicates, he hates evil, indicates that there is a God. And I know that's not a common language that we use today. We often go with our testimony, which is a great thing. But it's being challenged because we live in a very relativistic uh, society where that is good for you, but that might not be good for me. You see? So just because you say you're a Christian and you believe such because something happened, God saved you from a miracle, a lifestyle that you've lived, well, that's good for you, but that's not good for me. You see, that's the argument that they use. So sometimes our testimony is challenged. It it may not be accepted. Just because you follow a certain figure or you, 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 
um, uh, quote scripture. If you say you go to a church, a Baptist church, automatically that closes the door of the conversations. So we have to find ways as Christians in our defense to really defend who Christ is and to be able to explain that and articulate that and have those discussions from a different realm. Okay. Now, as I said last week, if God calls you to share your testimony with somebody, you share it. That's between them and God. But I'm challenging you that perhaps there are other ways to be able to share our faith because of the culture that we live in. So today, the question lies. These are the questions that people often ask if God truly exists, why is this? Right? If God exists, why am I in such pain? If God exists, why, does not, why doesn't he not answer my prayers? If God exists, why does he not keep his promises? If God exists, why, does, why do I feel that he's so silent? Right? That's the question that's coming out in our mind. And we learn, need to learn to defend that. But what's great is, What's great is, is that Scripture indicates that. We have the very blueprint, the very process map that we can share Christ and articulate and defend our our, our faith through Scripture. And so we're going to learn that in the life of, of Stephen. As believers and followers of Jesus, people are counting on you and me to answer these very key questions. And that's founded in Scripture. Okay? So that's kind of, that's the crux of where we are going to be uh, today. So turn to your Bibles uh, to Acts chapter 7, verse 1 to 8. If you want to stand in reverence to God's Word, I encourage you to stand as we read. The verses are going to be behind me. Verse 1 to 8, very short verses. The high priest said to Stephen, Are these things so? Because remember, they conspired against him. And he, Stephen says this, Hear me, brethren and fathers. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran. And he said to him, Leave your country and your relatives and come into the land which I will show you. Then he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. From there, after his father died, God had him moved to this country in which you are now living. But he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, yet even when he had no child. He promised that he would give him a possession and that to his descendants after him. But God spoke to this effect that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said the Lord. And after they will come out and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob to the twelve patriarchs. Okay, you can be seated. So Stephen gives the defense of his faith by starting with the story of Abraham. See, the part of the thing is is that you have to know who you are engaging with in the conversation. You have to know who your audience is. But he knew, he selected Abraham because all the Jews knew about Abraham. They just didn't know about his faith. They know about him, but not really truly know him and what he stood for and and the faith that he had. So we have to learn, number one, Number one, this is the pre, uh, this is pre point number one. You have to know your audience. You have to know the playing field. You have to know where they're coming from. You need to know perhaps where their, what their story is in their situation. So be wary of that. Instead of using kind of like a shotgun approach of just like, hey, I'm going to say this and it's going to just hit everything, right? Perhaps. We have to know where they come from. We have to know their story. And where that comes from is is how do do we get to know them? Is we got to truly care for them. We have to genuinely care for these people. Right? They will know if you're a genuine Christian by your words and your actions and your act of care. Your act that that you, when you say things, that you're going to do it. 
So you have to demonstrate that first. That is usually the first line of defense for them. So when we engage in those discussions, those are very key issues. Now we're going to go to point number one. All right. Stephen uh, challenges his audience with this. Number one, point number one, God's silence is biblical. God's silence is biblical. So remember that question that, you, that I just proposed earlier? If God exists, then why, don't, why, come, why can't he answer my, my prayers right now? I want it like right now. Why, if God exists, why am I so alone? How come I can't sense him? I can't hear him. How come everything, everything, every good thing that I try to do just doesn't work out? Just because of because of his lack of answering, then I can equate that God doesn't exist. But God puts it in the situation where silence is golden. That's when he's actually speaking. We're just not in tune with him. We're not seeing him clearly. So therefore, God sometimes may put you in in that situation to be the closest testimony for Jesus, for, 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 for this person that you're sharing Christ with. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12. We're going to turn to Genesis. Most of the uh, verses we're going to go through is Genesis. In the book of Acts, it talks about a little bit about Abraham, as we just read. But let's go to the source, right? Let's go to the source, and let's go to Genesis. And I'm going to be jumping from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis 18. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, is where we see the Abraham story come in the picture first in Scripture. It says there, God speaking, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you all families of the earth will be blessed. We will see this question unravel in the life and journey of Abraham throughout these scriptures, right? Through Genesis chapter 12 through verse eight, uh, chapter 18. So here are the facts that we need to know. As Ab- Abram comes into the scene, God promises him three things. And we're going to see this throughout scripture in the Old Testament, in the New Testament too. God is going to pl- uh, promise him land, all right, seed, and blessings. Land, seed, and blessings. Really simple. Okay? And we're going to see that. We see the land, the united kingdom, and then the kingdom to come afterwards, right? And I'm talking about Genesis, uh, uh, Revelation. We're going to see the seed, right? Jesus being the seed to save humanity, right, from our sins, and the blessings that's going to flow, right? So right here, we, 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 Abram, Abram was 75 years old. So we're going to do a little exercise. God took him, uh, uh, told him with, with Lot, and told him to leave with his, uh, his nephew Lot and his wife Sarai and their stuff with no child, right, to go somewhere. So there's an elapsed time between Genesis chapter 12 and, verse, uh, and chapter 16, about 10 years, and Genesis 17 to 18, about 13 years. So 20 plus years of Abraham's life and his journey with God is recorded in these very short passages. Now, he was 99 years old when God finally gave him a son. Mind you, a promised child of that age, right? So this is an exercise for you. So if you are around age 70... (laughs) Oh, oh, all right, age 70 and beyond, I want you to raise your hands. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, all right, that's okay. A four, maybe five, okay. So this is an exercise. So turn to your circle right here, you, sir, that's uh, 70. All right, I want you to turn to them, and for these ladies here, right, I want you to turn to your neighbors and say, I'm going to have a child. <laughs> and see what the response is. Okay, congratulations. So we can. <laughs> so 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 with that pure with that exercise, okay, a short exercise. What is your response? <laughs> no cursing in this church, though. Okay, <laughs> in the parking lot. No, I'm just playing. Just... 
right? So imagine the response of the people, right? When you said, hey, I'm going to have a child at this age, you'd be like, what? Nothing coming out of here, right? <laughs> is what the woman was saying, okay? It's unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. So if you take your life, right, imagine you're in Genesis chapter 12, and you're there in the background as God was telling Abram, you are going to have a child. And guess what? He's 75 years old. And his wife is about that same age, right? Unbelievable is what it is. Impossible. But sometimes the impossibility is not God's silence. That's what I'm saying. Because if he is God, if he's truly God, if he's the cause, if he's the intelligent designer, he can do anything that he desires. He can do anything. No science. Nothing can stop what he wants to do. So you think about that and just camp on that. He can do anything. And perhaps maybe the way to share that sometimes silence, silence is golden. That means God is working and God is using you and God is changing you in the process of his journey as he has used Abram. Right? So Abraham's experience was not only biological miracle by God, but also geographical miracle. So think about this. Abram was 75 years old, and he had to travel 1,500 miles from Ur, modern-day Iraq, to Haran, modern-day Syria, to Canaan, modern-day Israel. So if you look at the map, if you know anything about the Middle East, the you know that one, one, the quickest way to get from point A to point B is what? It's a straight line. But if you look at the map, it doesn't make sense, does it? If you look at the map, Iraq stands on the very east. And he's telling them to go to Egypt and to Syria and to Canaan. So it's kind of like this full circle, Right? It's uh, impossible. At age 75, if God tells you, okay, God tells you, go ahead and pack up all your stuff, right? We can't even pack up our stuff for the garage sale. <laughs> but we gave you one extra week, didn't we? Isn't that, that's God right there. That's God working, right? What do they say? One man's junk is another man's? That's right. Okay, so imagine Abram trying to haul these things with him. And, and, and the, the GPS doesn't make sense. He's telling him, God is telling him to go to these, these little the, these cities. It does not make sense. Now, as you guys know, I don't have a, any military experience, right? Some of you guys do. God bless you guys. But in the wake of Desert Storm in 1991-92, Saddam Hussein said, okay, if you want war, bring it on, U.S. So we come with our tanks. Now, it, Saddam Hussein buried his tanks underneath the, the sand to be able to count an attack, a counter against the U.S. But one thing Saddam Hussein didn't know is that this technology name, na known as Global Positioning System was what the U.S. military used for the first time. And were able to navigate through the deserts of Iraq and to be able to counter the attack of uh, uh, the Iraqis against the U.S. So we demolished. And I know of veterans that were part of that. I know tank people that was part of that and told me what they experienced firsthand. So what am I saying? I'm saying is that in the midst of this desert field, remember, Iraq is full of desert. God telling you, 75 years old, to haul your nephew, which we'll come and talk about later on, and then your wife, Sarai, who's barren, and all your stuff in this desert without GPS. Right? How many of you guys go to Houston having to use your GPS? Right? Amen, right? We've accustomed to that. I'm, te I'm teaching my boys, hey, you got to learn how to use the map, okay? North, south, east, west. you got to learn how to do that. So if you think about that, a geographical 
miracle that he got, he was able to leave and depart his land to a foreign land, right? No U-Haul, okay? He had to pack up all his belongings and his junk. He had lots of animals, right? He was a pretty wealthy rancher. He had no AC. Think about that. No buckies, no clean bathrooms, no bucky nuggets. You name it, right? No picture with the bucky, the bucky, right? They traveled hundreds of miles from their cultural home. This is the other miracle. From a cultural standpoint, it was a miracle. You do not leave in this, this, that land, and to this day, you do not leave where you go to a place where you do not know anybody. Why? Because your family and your friends protect you. But if you go to foreign lands, you don't have that protection, let alone not speak the language. So he goes culturally, right, away from their cultural home and found themselves in a foreign land, again, childless. This is another biological miracle. So if you think of the book of Ruth, you guys have read that many, many times, right? You see you have Ruth, who was a Moabite, right? And his, her mother-in-law, Naomi, who left their land. And when she came back, she didn't have a husband because her husband died. And moreover, she didn't have sons because her sons died. But only this Gentile woman came with her name, Ruth, Right? She came back without a husband, without a son, no land, no business, no livelihood, only to be redeemed by God and God only. Through Boaz, right, who was, had this land and he told him to glean in this field, right? But he caught her, her, his eye and then later on became the grandfather of King David. You see this love story in its sense. The Bible is a love story. I don't care what type of novel you read, that's great. If you think that's great, this is a love story. A love story of God and His children. A love story where you don't have to be perfect. That's why He sent His Son, Jesus, to die on your behalf for, for you and me. Because He knew he can, you can't do it along. He knew that to, be, to begin with. But because of His love, because of our love, that is the very testimony that we need to be able to defend our faith. That when God seemed to be silent, He's actually moving in the lives of His people. Get that, right? Okay, moving on. So, verses, uh, I've got two verses to share with you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 10. You guys know this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself... It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Hebrews 11.1, 1, you, you need to pencil these in in your Bibles. So when you struggle with your faith, you can go. When you say, God, why are you so silent? How come I can't sense you? You can go to these verses. Now faith is an assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Right? This is where we believe the air exists. We can't see air, right? But we can feel air. We can sense air somehow if it's going west or east, whatever direction it is. We can, but so we know it's there, but we can't see it. That is faith. Right? These are very, these are nuggets of wisdom, nuggets of tools that you can share to defend your faith, but you have to have faith yourself in Christ. All right, next, next point. This is the last point. Two points today only. Keep it short, right? Got NASCAR going on and baseball and everything, so more important things. It's just going around in circles anyways. All right, so number two, God, God's goodness is magnified despite our imperfections. This is the argument where we, we feel that I have to be in good accord with God first. I got to do these things first. I have to perform a certain way first before God answers my prayers. But he knows. He knows that huh, you're not good enough. That's why he sent his son, Jesus, to save you and me. 
So, we're going back to the story of Abram. Abram was an ordinary guy. He was not perfect, as we see in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10 to 20, right? Sarai and Abraham, and we, we see Sarah and Abram in Egypt. Remember that story? Where he lied and says, oh yeah, Sarai is my wife. I'm sorry, Sarah is my sister. My sister, not my wife, right? And then we see this in, later on with Abimelech, same thing. You see the insecurity of Abram. God spoke to him, and he was still insecure. Imagine that. One great thing is this past uh, Friday, Friday night is movie night and pizza night at our house, the Wynn house, right? And we watch our, it's the first time I've watched this. Uh, I saw the Disney like cartoon version of the movie Aladdin. Remember that, right? But this one is with Will Smith, right? Okay? So, 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 so what did Aladdin do when he, he rubbed that lamp? He wanted Jasmine, right? He thought he had to be this great king of whatever land, right? That didn't exist. But he knew that just because you have this great entourage doesn't mean that is who you are. The genie can only change the exterior, but the person had to have an interior change. Does that, does that make sense? So as Christians, as Christians, God can do amazing things, but you have to believe that through faith that God is going to do what He's going to do and that God's called you to do greater things than you have ever anticipated. But it starts with you. Okay. The story of Aladdin is not in my notes. I just, I just came out. All right. <laughs> so, so we see this very insecure Abram. But we also see that he was very impatient. So turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Okay? So he says here, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great, that in in Genesis 16, his wife Sarai conspired to have their maid Hagar to bear a son for him. So, so he, it says in Genesis 12, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to be a father of nations. So they're like saying, okay, God, you know, I'm 75 years old. All right, ain't happening. That was like 10 years ago when you said that. And you're telling me again in, in, uh, in, in, in um, Genesis 17, right, that now he's 99 years old here. 25 year, 24, 25 years has elapsed since God first encountered him and said he's going to be the father of nations. So Genesis, yes, God has spoken. Genesis 17, verse 1 to 5. Sorry, Genesis 17, verse 1 to 5. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I'm God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between you and me, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked to, with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of multitudes of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name should be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of multitudes of nations." So Abram is scratching his head probably, because I would. He's saying, okay, when I was 75 years old, you said that, and I'm 99 years old, and it hasn't happened yet, man. Come on, what's going on? So what did they do? Him and his wife Sarai conspired and said, you know what? We have a little ma a maid named Hagar. Let's, let's actually, let's help God out, is what they said. Let's, let's kind of speed the process. You know, God is a very busy guy, right? He's, he has tons of stuff going on. Let's go help him out by you being with, with Hagar. Okay, I can't even imagine Sarah doing that. But anyways, any wife would uh, do that. But she did. And therefore gave birth as if they were helping God. Now think about that. Do we often do that and say, hey, you know, God, remember you said this. Um, just let you know, I'm going to help you out a little bit this time, right? But we find that when we try to help God, what do we do? We make it worse exactly we make it worse so moreover right so after that 24 24 years later abraham charged to be circumcised so this is when in this in this in genesis 17 when he's putting things together he's realized hey you know what i don't have this together 
I try to take matters in my own hands, and guess what? I messed up. So what is it, God, that you promise that I can take? So he's now, he's full fledged. He's ready to go. He's like, Lord, I'm going to have faith. So because of that, the act of his faith says, I'm going to be circumcised. That's what God said. So he got circumcised. And then his son, who's 13 years old at that time, said he got circumcised too. And the whole village and his people got circumcised. So you imagine this. So he's going to take his faith seriously. He says, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, um, we're gonna take this seriously, take God seriously. I'm, I need all the boys and men to line up. And I'm going to go, okay, next person. No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. Right? So imagine that. Right? But if you read in Scripture, that's what they, the whole town, they had a circumcision party. It's basically, that shows their demonstration of their seriousness of faith. Okay? All right, I'm sorry. I know I got the youth laughing over here. They're like, ugh. Right? Remember, no anesthesia. Okay? No, no sterile merchandise. It's like, hey, you know, you get this knife and I don't know, like... I don't know, <laughs> clean it with a rag or something like that. Just get it ready to chop it off. I don't know. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on. All right. L Larry says move on. Okay, Larry. Okay. <laughs> so, moreover, <laughs> moreover, same chapter of Genesis 17, verse 15, then God said to Abram, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and indeed, I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Then Abram fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Will a child be born to a, a man of 100 years old, and will Sarah who is 90 years old, bear a child? So we see this again. God is not, he knows that Abram is, 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 has some flaws, as we have flaws. We are imperfect. But just because we are imperfect doesn't indicate that God is imperfect. God is always perfect. And he always will be because he is God. So we, we sometimes think that we have to get things in order. We have to be good. We have to perform such, such thing to believe in God. No. Just for you to recognize that you are sinful is enough. That's the very first step of where we need to be in Christ. Because of doing so, we are humbled by Him, and He can resurrect us so that we may be called his children, right? So what, what's great is, if you think God has a sense of humor, check this out. So in Genesis chapter 21, right, we see that God fulfills his promise. Sarai gets pregnant, she delivers and names him, her son, Isaac, which is translated as laughter. So every time she says laughter, she's, she, she, she says her son's name. How many times have you called your son's name or daughter's name? Like, all right, Riley, take out the trash. Joel, take out, I mean, like the whole day, right? Pretty much hundreds of thousands of times, right? So imagine she says that. She is reminded of that God has the last laugh. Remember what God, what, what you thought that was impossible was possible in Christ. Always, every time. So, God is not amused with your performance or your goodness or the lack of, or the lack of your goodness before we can have fellowship with you. He knows He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. He's in every situation that you and me are in. We cannot do this on our own. It is through faith through Jesus Christ, that we are saved. So James chapter 2.23 uh, 2, says this, And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abram believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called friend of God. Yeah, the guy, the guy and his wife that laugh, yes, that's God's friend. So imagine the times that you've laughed. You said, or you try to help God, or you thought that God was inadequate 
because it's not set on your parameters or your time, God still calls you his son and his daughter. He calls you his friend. There's no other faith, religion can even come close to where we stand before Christ because he's God. You notice earlier that gentleman that was on the screen. Well, you know what? I can be, I'm God. I could do whatever I want. And then you had that software engineer that says, you know what? I do a lot of work. It takes a lot of things, a lot of mind, power, and energy to get something done. Tells me that there is a created being. So just that in itself is enough. You need to know where you stand as a believer in Christ. You need to know so that you can defend it at all costs. So last verse, last verse right here. Romans chapter 6, turn your Bibles there, okay? This is a very powerful verse, and I want to share with you. I know I shared with you Romans chapter 8, but we're going to go to 6 real quick to show what God has called us for, okay? Verse 1, and I'm going to read from verse 1 to verse 11. What shall we say then? Are you to continue in sin? Now that we know that we have faith in Christ, right? All right? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So he's saying this. Why live the life that you lived before Christ? Now that you know Christ, right? There are many people that can take advantage of that. That's what I'm saying. That's what he's, Paul is saying right here. You can say, you know what? God's going to forgive me anyways. He's an all-loving, good God, right? When you do that, you be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. Because you, in a sense, are playing God. So he's saying... Don't live that way. You don't have to. You're baptized. You don't have to live that way. You were dead before and you are alive now. Don't go to your own vomit again. Right? As it says in Jeremiah. Here it says here, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death. So as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. We should live in his resurrection, not in death. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we were no longer slaves to sin. We have an option. We have freedom. But why is it, as Christians, we keep going back to the jail cell? Why do we keep going back to the bondage that we so have been rescued from from Christ? Why do we go back to what feels good? Why do we go back to our childhood ways? Why is that? He's saying you have an option. You have a freedom now. Knowing this, that your old self was crucified through Christ in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that you are no longer to be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. For we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never again to die again. Death no longer has master over him and you and me. Wow. No longer has master over you. We have an option. That's great. We have an advocate, Jesus, for death that, has, that he had died. He died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So when you walk out in the playing field of the world, know that you're a winner in Christ. Know that you have, a, you have freedom. Know that you have a treasure. Know that you are a friend of God. Know that you are sons and daughters of God amazing but if we forget those very key things if we just are back to the elementary of things we can be easily brought back to where we actually got saved from 
Be careful, church. I want to share with you. Be careful. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready to make a defense of your faith. Knowing God, that when God seemed to be silent, He's actually alive and involved in you and li- my life. Well, knowing that when God doesn't want your perfections, He has a perfect Son that died for you and me. Wow. We can always point to that. That no other religion, no other faith can even come close. All those deities are dead. They're, they don't give their very best. They don't give their son as a sacrifice for you and me. They have this thing called karma. And when you die and you have karma, when your next life is, you have karma as well. It follows you. But Jesus cuts that off and he took on our sin in our iniquities and died for us. Guys, our faith cannot be compared to any other faith or philosophies that are in this world. Let's pray. Father God, come, we come before you and we thank you so much, God, for the word. Thank you so much, God, for the call, not just to make disciples of men, which is great, but to defend our faith. We so need you We so need you right now, our country, our world, our nation, Father. We need you, God, to help us as Christians to stand up, to defend our faith, and to not be weary, to not be concerned or insecure of the ramifications, because that is part of the Christian journey. We will suffer, we will be ridiculed, we will be set aside, we will be dismissed because of our faith, because that is what you've called us to do. And help us to stay, to stand in the gap of that. And help us to not falter through. Lord, help us, give us courage, Father, that we need. We ask, I ask, Father, for courage in the lives of our church, the very families that are represented at our church, the, the husband, the wife, the children, the grandchildren, the grandparents that are parenting still. Lord, I ask, God, for you to give us power to give us strength, Lord, to know, God, that we have a higher calling. We have a higher calling to defend our faith for you so that others can know you, Lord. Thank you so much, God, for reminding us, reminding us that you are always active, that you are always present in every circumstance and issues that we face in life. Give us confidence and boldness. In Christ's name we pray, amen. So this is uh, your opportunity to respond as a church. Uh, I want to open up the area here for you to pray. Uh, As individuals, as family, as siblings, as parents, as couples, single, this is your opportunity to respond. I want you to come and pray. Pastor Joseph and I would be here. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, Joy will be here as well. Uh, For the ladies, um, we're here to receive you and pray for you in your journey.
Amen. You can be seated. Uh, I'm going to have Miss Modell come up here, and we have a uh, um, uh, lady of our church, our, uh, Miss Georgia, that we want to be praying for. So if you want to grab a mic there, maybe, perhaps, and we can pray as Miss Modell leads us. Um, I'm not sure a good many of y'all know Miss Georgia. Um, Ollie put out over Facebook the other day about she's going home to be with the Lord soon and uh, I just feel that we need to stop right at this moment and offer up prayer for her as she prepares to go to be with her Lord she's a sweet woman sweet woman father God I just right now I bring to you at your feet father God we bring to you Georgia Lord sweet sweet soul father God we pray for her transition into your arms, Lord. Right now we know you have her. And as Pastor said moments ago, it won't be long now. And she will walk in the newness of life in Christ forever and ever. Father God, we thank you for this, that we know that she will be with you. Lord, I lift up to her to you. I lift her family up to you. And Lord, just as they go through this time when they're with her for just a bit longer, Lord. We thank you that she has graced our church here, our church family, and we thank you for the love that her children have for her and the reverence for her and for you, dear Lord God. And we praise you and we thank you for all of this, that she's been a blessing to us and that she will be ever so much a blessing to you in your presence. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. 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 All right, church, you are dismissed. Thank you. Mm -hmm.